We took the band down to J.D. Miller's recording studio in Crowley, and we started recording about 7 o'clock at night, ended about 4 o'clock the next morning. It took a long time because in those days, everything was done on one track. Uh, the piano player would make a mistake and hit a wrong chord. The sax player would hit a bad note. And more often than not, I hit off notes, either high, too high, too low, flat, sharp, whatever. So we finally got it recorded about 4 o'clock the next morning, and I had a real bad nosebleed that started about 3.30. I wrapped a towel around my face, and that's how we finally ended up recording This Should Go On Forever. It's a unique and different singing style that no one else has ever copied. I was right. It, it was a hit, and it was accepted uh, as a hit locally right away. Uh, the jute boxes were doing real good with it. In fact, I had a time uh, getting inventory in. We had... Um, uh, we were pressing at the time with RCA Records up in Linden, New Jersey, I think it was. I had to get them uh, on the train and pick them up at the train station here, run them down to the bus station to ship them down to New Orleans so my distributor there could get them out to the stores. It began selling in Lake Charles and it became a hit in Beaumont, then in Houston and in Dallas with little promotion or little hype. The song started selling and some of the big labels were calling MGM, Capto, Columbia calling Floyd, calling me wanting to lease it. After much negotiating and soul searching, Floyd finally made a decision to lease it to Leonard Chess with Chess Check and Argo Records in Chicago. Now this was a label that Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley and many of the other black singers were recording for and were big hits nationally. They put the record out on Argo Records and it became a national hit and went up in the top ten on some of the national charts. Signing with Chess Records led to appearances on The Alan Freed Show and Dick Clark's American Bandstand. When the record was released nationally, I went on a two-week promotion tour to all of the major cities, Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia, appearing on each of the local bandstand programs in that particular town. At the end of the two-week tour was an appearance on American Bandstand. Well, Dick Clark had started playing This Should Go On Forever on his afternoon programs. He received a letter from a gentleman in some state objecting to the lyrics. One line said, if it's sin to really love you, I'll forever live in sin. And this man thought it was really bad to let teenagers listen to a song with such bad meanings. So Dick Clark, being a really nice guy, uh, wanting to do the right thing, asked us to re-record the song. We flew a music track up to Chicago. I flew in there late one night, and we re-recorded This Should Go On Forever, changing that line to say, if it's wrong to really love you, then wrong I'll always be. We had one record pressed, and this is the one that I pantomimed to an American bandstand two weeks later. I gave you a little tip, like I said, this should go on forever. That's the name of a song. Let's read Rod Bernard. spent most of the next year traveling across America promoting This Should Go On Forever and doing promotional tours and one night shows, appearing with Frankie Avalon, with Chuck Berry, the Skyliners, Jerry Lee Lewis, Mickey Gilly, and many of the top singers at that time. It was really hard to do. Many nights we played in one particular town, then we packed up and traveled all night and all the next day to reach the destination in the next show the following night. Then the second and third day the same thing happened. It was a grueling pace, but it was fun at the time. And plus it was very interesting meeting a lot of people and getting to know all about the music business and how the recording business worked. Rod returned to Opelousas as a town hero. The mayor had proclaimed a Rod Bernard Day in his honor and he was greeted with a key to the city. He had come home a national recording star. In 1959, J.P. Richardson, better known as the big bopper of Chantilly Lace fame, died in a tragic plane wreck with recording superstars Richie Valens and Buddy Holly. Richardson's manager, Bill Hall of Beaumont, Texas, 
began searching for a new talent to promote. And I just didn't have the time to get out on the road and, and do too much, so I was glad that somebody else with experience could come around and take Rod by the hand and then do something with him. Although in the long run I ended up losing Rod, um, it still was probably for the best for him and uh, it, didn't, uh, it didn't really hurt the label. We had one good hit under our belt and which led to others down the way and eventually Rod and I got back together later and, and did some more recordings and uh, uh, I was glad to have been a very small part in the beginning of uh, Rod's career as it worked out. After Rod's contract with the Mercury label expired, he recorded for Hall's own label, releasing several popular swamp pop hits, including A Might As Well, Loneliness, Forgive, and Fado Do. At that time, Rod recorded his second major hit, his own version of the popular Cajun tune, Allons Danser Colinda. In 1962, my manager was Bill Hall, who also managed the Big Bopper and Johnny Preston, who had Running Bear and some other singers in the Louisiana and East Texas area. His recording engineer was Jack Clements, who had written and produced a lot of the Johnny Cash songs for the old Sun label in Memphis. Jack had an idea of combining some Cajun and rock and roll and country all into one. That's when we came up with Colinda. It was a song that we recorded in Beaumont, Texas in 1962 with four musicians, two of them were Johnny and Edgar Winter. Paid them $10 each to record Kalinda, and it was a national hit. After Kalinda, I joined the Marine Corps, serving in the Marine Corps Reserve for six months. After returning to Lafayette and to KVOL as a DJ and music director, one of my fellow DJs, Skip Stewart, and a musician friend of ours, Warren Storm, and I formed a band called the Shondells, playing in nightclubs throughout South Louisiana for the next several years. We combined country and Cajun and rock and roll into a style that was known as swamp pop. Though somewhat successful, we had a lot of competition from the British invasion because that was a time when the Beatles hit the United States coast. In order to capitalize on the then ongoing Beatle craze, Rod and the Shondells incorporated a Beatles act into their own regular show. But despite Rod's love for his work, his hectic schedule soon began to overtake him. Playing music with the Shondells, working at KVOL in Lafayette and doing Saturday hop on weekends was a killing pace. The radio station I worked five in the morning till nine, then I worked nine to three in sales, three to six back on the air again, then every night, six nights a week, we played dances at different towns and cities throughout Louisiana. Saturdays was not a rest day because that's, of course, when we did Saturday hop. On Sundays, we played two dances, one from two to six, another that night from eight to twelve. In 1965, Rod married Joanne King, a student at the local university. He subsequently decided to settle down and give up his music career for one in radio and television broadcasting. However, throughout the late 60s and 70s, Rod continued to appear on stage throughout the Acadiana region of the state. He also released several albums on Floyd Swallow's Gin label, including one with Grammy Award winner Clifton Chenier. He recorded his last album in 1978 on the Crazy Cajun label. However, an Ace label version of his first album has recently been released in England. He made his last public appearance at the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival in 1984. Rod has since completely relinquished his musical career in order to concentrate on his job at KLFY TV as a broadcaster and advertising salesman. He now lives on a farm on the outskirts of Lafayette where he and his family raise half-Arab horses for pleasure. Rod has few regrets about leaving the music world. I had a lot of fun in the music business, got to travel a lot, meet a lot of people, do a lot of things, but I feel like I've used it as a stepping stone to get to what I really wanted to do all along, and that's a career in radio and television. And mostly in the ultimate was television. Now I work as a sales representative. I write, sell, and produce television commercials for KLFY Television in Lafayette, Louisiana. And every day I work with a lot of nice people and get to do a lot of fun things. As British author John Brovin wrote in his book, South to Louisiana, this should go on forever was a unique passport into the exhilarating inside world of rock and roll, where Rod was able to rub shoulders with legends, to make personal appearances on star-studded caravans, at modest record hops, on Dick Clark's American Bandstand, to see the good and bad in the record business, in human nature generally, and to take pride in the role he played in spreading the South Louisiana swap pop sound throughout the nation. Rod's hit record had provided an epic, unrepeatable adventure, yearned for by many, 
attained by few. Thank you, Rob. Oh, man, I like it.